Today we're going to be doing a solo challenge with Drowsy and Pokemon Yellow and I couldn't believe the Drowsy slander in my community when we did the stream a little bit ago. If you do want to watch that Mind Run stream, it is in the description, the link's down there. But after designing the overlay, drawing some thumbnails, spending a few runs with this Pokemon, I've came to have like a newfound like for this little chunky boy. It's a little mischievous taper based on some dream eating folklore and it doesn't hurt that it's yellow, that is my favorite color, but I'm excited to kind of share this run with you guys. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do Pokemon solo runs with the ultimate goal of ranking them against each other after several runs with some optimizations the rules i use are detailed down in the description so check that out and if you are a returning subscriber like jonathan runco i do appreciate the support so grab yourself a soda pop and let's just get into it Drowsy's a bit of a sleeper Pokemon, and by sleeper I don't mean, hey guys, this Pokemon's secretly really good, but rather I mean that it's in this little subset of Pokemon that I really don't enjoy playing the most. It's the kind that rely on sleep status just to make it through the game. It puts a ton of extra RNG emphasis on the runs, and suffice it to say that Drowsy, he's a little bit slow, he's gonna rely on badge boost later in the game, but you do have to rely on Hypnosis very, as early as you can really get. If you don't use it on Eevee in the lab battle, it felt like about a 50-50 chance you would just lose right here at the beginning of the game. And I do want to go against that Flareon team, so today, sleep strats, they're going to start popping up already. Moving ahead, I don't want to become an advocate for which version of the game is easier or harder, because I only deal in the facts and the data. And I would like to think that the quality of the runs that I do, or the races that I've placed high in just speak for themselves. But you hear this all the time, and it's not going to be a black and white issue. Sorry for what you might think. Even after countless videos, people, they still perceive Yellow as the much harder version. And while I'm not going to go into it much today, Yellow does have an easier early game. And I think you just need to know two facts about Generation 1 solo running just to get the idea. Number one is that without question, Brock is the toughest challenge in the entire game on average. I'd say about 75 or 80% of the original 151 are going to struggle here. And number two is that Yellow makes the Brock split significantly easier for reasons I've covered ad nauseum. I just I can't stake this enough now sometimes I do feel like a conspiracy theorist connecting the obvious little dots on the whiteboard but I really do have to repeat this information a lot and remember I do test both versions and I just really want to make sure I'm getting the fastest run for whatever Pokemon I'm doing so with that out of the way we need to take it back to the run let's not go too off the rails just yet we only have pound for a really long while we also have hypnosis and while drowsy does have a lot of positive things to it it's Brock split is abysmal and this one it actually took a little bit of thinking to kind of get right and feel pretty good. The final strategy I ended up going with is not really anything out of the ordinary. I battle the double Nidoran last, then I go to the first optional bug catcher. That gets me to level 8 heading into the mandatory bug catcher. This really helps with damage rounding because if you go here at level 6, it felt pretty bad, pounded absolutely pathetic damage and even though I do use hypnosis here you really didn't have to I just wanted to be a little bit more safe now after that I can spend my money and that means it's time for some I know I also explain this part of the game a lot too, but the idea, to keep it really short, the idea is that trainers give 50% extra experience, it's much more efficient to take out the Diglett and let the Sandshrew take you out. Now this always feels good in yellow version, whereas in red version it usually has me pulling out my hair a little bit. The main difference outside of it being a higher level in red is that Sandshrew no sand attack, and it could just really feel like you're wasting a lot of time as you just sit there turn after turn after turn just begging it to kill you, but it just chooses the sand instead. But with Drowsy, this one takes a little bit of planning as well. You need to get to the place you ultimately need to go with just a little bit of patience. By the time you hit level 10, you kind of get to that point to where it's really hard to lose the battle. So my strat was to hopefully maybe miss a Hypnosis or two, let the Diglett kind of chip off some more HP, and it would make it a pretty comfortable loss. It could be a little bit tedious and it's not the best, but it is faster than wild grinding steel. The funny thing about Drowsy is that it becomes really good at this kind of grinding when you make it to level 12 and that's because you get Disable. It doesn't debuff the opponents, it doesn't do any damage, it allows you to pretty much blackout grind as long as you realistically want to. Now don't get it twisted, Disable is a god awful move in Generation 1 especially, but today it actually gets some uses and not even just in this situation and we'll get into that a little bit later. We have a very specific goal today and 
and I'll go over some more thoughts about this early game in a bit, but we want to be level 15, about 180 experience from level 16 when we wrap this up, and that's pretty much going to be the end of the training for the early game, but before we look at Brock, it's important to know that the strategy that I ultimately landed on for this run, it wasn't the most consistent thing. Usually I go for some pretty consistent stuff, but I think to have your best time and your best shot for this Pokemon, you need to take a little bit of a risk. You do need to go heal your pound PP at the center first. Uh, missing, when you look at it, missing six pounds out of 35, it doesn't seem like much, but it is enough to make the first gym a lot more tough than it needs to be, and we already know that Brock's one of the toughest challenges in the game. I would say the toughest for this run specifically. The experience range that I grinded to combined with full PP, it gives you what I feel like about a maybe a 70%, maybe a little bit below to actually get through this fight. But before we cut to black and we look at the rock solid Pokemon trainer, just know that we're going to be skipping ahead. I do have some resets here. Don't be shocked. This is not a clean fight. There's three resets in total. We don't need to look at them in like painstakingly detailed moments. You're going to get a good gist of how the fight plays out. So we'll talk about this a little bit after, but that's enough stalling. Let's kind of just get to the fight. Take a look at the first gym. Geodude is first, and this is going to be the first historically documented practical use for Disable. I go for it turn one, I hit the 55% shot, but the computer, it inputs the cheat code, and it just straight up says no right to my face. It snaps out of it, it tackles me anyway. On the second turn, I get lucky, I do hit again, and this is going to nullify Brock's turn, but that's not really the important thing. Pound, it doesn't do a lot of damage here, but the key is that you can actually force the Geodude to use Struggle, and the recoil damage does as much damage as Pound would. These are going to start to add up really really quickly, but you are going to take a solid chunk of damage since Drowsy does not have the best defense stat. The resets mainly come from where if you, maybe if you like miss disable a couple of times or you ultimately just start to get too low in HP to contend with the Onyx, but you can see here that this didn't go perfect and it only took five pounds with the recoil damage to move on, but we set our experience up. We hit level 16 after the fight. This gives us some more stats. It heals us just a little bit, but more importantly, it does let us outspeed the Onyx. Hypnosis is another reason that this fight can go south like it did for my other resets. It's inaccurate and we're going to talk about it several times this video. But if you just have really bad luck where you miss like three or four hypnosis in a row, you're just going to lose this battle. We all know that Brock has about 17 full heals, but if he uses Bide, the game just doesn't let him use items for some reason. So the best case scenario here is that it goes for Bide, you do outspeed, you can put it to sleep, and then you're going to get a lot of free turns without worrying about the full heals. Now it has to be said that Pound does absolutely nothing to Onyx, and this is just one huge battle of attrition, and our health is really low to where we don't really have much margin for error, but I am able to actually squeak by, and let me talk about this early game a little bit more outside of the battle. We do get the badge. The safest play for a consistent drowsy run, if such a thing even exists, is just to get to level 17, get confusion, and just steamroll through Brock with two one-shots. If you did that, I would say there's no reason to even play yellow version, because either one you played, you're just going to one-shot Brock either way. Now, in the blind run, we tried several levels before I worked my way to this strategy, but let's just talk about why it was really significant to not do Brock at level 17. Pokemon Red has less experience pre-Brock, and overall, getting to 17 there would just take a lot of time that you couldn't make up through the course of the game and that's ultimately what it came down to. My test showed me that going into Brock at level 15 in yellow, doing things this way can save you anywhere from 7 to 10 minutes depending on your luck, maybe even a little bit more, which is uh, it's a significant time save and the only advantage that the slow route has over this one is that it gets confusion a little bit earlier and it doesn't even get it that much earlier than the faster overall speed run. Brock does take a while to get through and then you just gotta pound through just two little bitty trainers on route three and after that you do get confusion and i would say at this point the real run can begin the power level increase here is massive and if you want some numbers here without any direct spoilers this section of the game makes up about 30 percent of the entire run and you can just see right here how it's night and day from using pound to going from that to confusion 
Now let's take it to Mount Moon and we have some of the usual suspects here. We're going to be doing some optional battles. We have the Super Nerd. Everybody knows the Super Nerd. Then we have the Double Grass Lass. And I'm going to be taking on the Hacker as well. That's our optional battles, but I do want to talk about Mega Punch just a little bit. I decided to cut this out because you just, you don't use it much. You only use it in one single battle. And you wouldn't think that it takes too much time to go down and pick up Mega Punch, but think about it this way. You're going to go down two ladders. You're going to pick up the item. You're going to go into the menu. You're going to learn the move, and then you're going to backtrack up two ladders now when you combine that with the fact that you don't have repels yet and every single solitary step that you take is an invitation for a zubat to walk right up to you and waste even more time i would say that this little bitty cut alone saved me about a minute or two in the run so i'm very confident that skipping mega punch was the play i mean even in this footage alone that i've been playing in the background you can see that i get lots of encounters just doing the standard path but let's move on by the time we make it to the end of mount moon i do hit level 20 everything pretty clean and we can just kind of transition straight into rival number two and this one's a free fight and runs where you're worried about the Spiro it's because of growl and we're not going to be using our attack stat today so we don't we don't care about growl and the only other real thing you need to know about this fight is that Sandshrew is a guaranteed one shot with confusion and that means despite having lower speed I don't really have to sweat this one today Now it's time for Nugget Bridge. You guys already know the deal. Single highest cluster, make it faster, yada yada, all that. I don't need to say it every video. Don't get me started. Don't even leave a comment about it because I'll, I'll go on for days about it. But I would say at the beginning of this run, I focused so much and talked so much about the meticulous early game that I'm going to finally go over some stats and moves here. Now let me know if you guys really need the stats or the moves. I keep them on the overlay at the start of the game and it would overall just be a little bit quicker to edit without them, but I do feel like they add a little bit to the video just I'm always looking for opinions on that kind of stuff now first I'm gonna show the moves and to me the comparison here is that drowsy is like Alakazam's much less attractive cousin you only get psychic moves to use your special with and you do get some normal moves like body slam to deal with the psychic mirror matchups it's very one-dimensional and it gets very few useful TMs and the goal here is to get level 29 for the strongest move in the game poison gas once you get poison gas the runs over I am I'm being sarcastic there if you can't tell but you do get an early psychic and a badge boosting move at level 37 and that's pretty much the two things that's going to take us to the promised land now let's talk about the stats and this is where drowsy ultimately just fails to me 90 special pretty good but i want you to just uh, move your eyes around to everything else it's actually a lot worse than you would think 42 speed is extremely poor and for something that has to use pound only at the start 48 attack it just kind of pushes drowsy's head under the proverbial water and gives us the slow time that we've already seen to this point but that's enough of that we can move ahead there's not much to see overall in nugget bridge and we can just start to talk about misty now the star you it's not interesting but i did hit level 24 for headbutt here and misty was the only battle that mega punch had some play in but butting your head against something is just as effective here there's a bit of an option play here you can choose one or the other if star me does a turn one x defend we're gonna go hypnosis into straight confusion like you're gonna see here but headbutt is a little bit better if you don't see that item being used this one it's not pretty it's a little bit slow but it's not difficult at all we grab the second badge and there's not really we could just be on our way I mentioned earlier that the Brock split was roughly a third of the run, so it goes without saying that the pace has already started to pick up a little bit, and we're about to turn that dial even further. That's gonna take us down to the SSN. Now, Body Slam is available. We're gonna grab it to deal with opposing psychic types. We get the rare candy, and we can just go straight to rival number three. Now, a general rule for me, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this a lot, but when I'm doing playthroughs, I always think about it this way. If you can comfortably and easily get past rival number two, then rival number three is gonna be really easy as well, and you saw that we are Already handled rival number two pretty good the truth about the drowsy run is that you really only have to elaborate on the beginning and then some later fights so we don't have to be stuck here for a while talking about if Evie's gonna use sand attack or not or some boring thing let's keep it rolling straight into lieutenant surge speaking of boring and I say this all the time but yellow version surge is just really interesting to me they went full anime they gave him only a single Raichu they took away his good AI and they made it kind of like a roll of the dice hardly anything in the entire game wants to take a mega kick crit and you can see how much damage the mega punch does to me and i'm just saying that surge can be a wild card in yellow but i do use sleep here just to be safe what else is there to really say 
afterwards, we don't need to look at Rock Tunnel. Instead, we can just go straight into Celadon territory. Today, I'm going to be going to the Rocket Hideout. I'm going to get the high money items. We'll show Giovanni in the background, but I do want to talk about something else for a second. I'm doing a 10 repel route. I don't really talk about my repel routes, but if you need to do an early buy, you buy four repels. If you want to hold off for a little bit, you buy 10. That's just my strategy. And we're buying 10 here. And you would think that you would go for four because you could just rush, get straight into that buy, get the fresh water and get an early psychic. But Drowsy has one kind of unique thing about it. It gets the earliest natural psychic in the game. So that means by the time we get done here, we're getting really close to getting psychic on our own and to just go ahead and get it without wasting more time, without doing anything else. We can go straight to Erica. And by the time we get done with the cool trainer that has the three middle stage Pokemon, we learn it naturally. So we already have psychic. And since we have psychic and we actually have pretty good special and the fact that Erica's nerfed in yellow, she has just middle stage Pokemon as well. That means we can just go straight into Erica, and we don't even have to talk about it too much, honestly. Psychic's just a really strong move to have right now, and even though Tangela just does its best, it's a pretty bulky Pokemon, I'll give it that. Everything else just falls to pretty much a single Psychic. Now we have a couple of slowdowns, a couple of hiccups here and there, but it's a pretty clean battle, and just like that, we already have four gems, and just like the previous few segments, we're about to start kind of rapid fire for a little bit until we get to some of those problem areas. First up is Pokemon Tower. Now I've spoke at length about if rival number two is easy and that's going to mean that rival number three is easy as well. So it's very rare for rival number four to be an issue. And when you combine that with the psychic damage, we can just zoom through here to the next location. Now I, I go into this fight extremely low if you really want an idea of how serious I take this fight. Next we'll be going down to the Safari Zone and I never really talk about this, but there's hardly ever, I can't even think of a reason to ever hold this off. You pick up the flat point for Fuchsia regardless of when you want to tackle the gym, you get free vitamins, you get a full restore, and you also get the final eight gems of the run. It's very lucrative and there's no drawbacks to it. That's going to take us straight into our one Celadon Mart buy for the run and learning Psychic so early, that's what let us ultimately hold off to let us kind of accrue more money and get vitamins without impacting the final time of the run. Now this is neither here nor there, but one of the benefits of not allowing the Pokedoss skip in the Pokemon Tower means that you just have more variance and strategy for things like this and overall it makes things a little bit more interesting to me personally. To not cap out on speed vitamins, I do pick up four carbos, three calciums. I messed up my money slightly. I have to sell a little bit. I waste a little bit of time, but it's fine. I'm not too worried about stuff like that. Now I'd like to talk about something that I said in stream. In yellow version, I do think rival number five is the easier choice for most runs, and I stand by that fully. But a user or two kept trolling me, kept using like the, the SpongeBob talking type meme. Like I was just completely wrong. I didn't do that great in the blind run by going to seal first. Now, first off, it's a blind run. You should not expect expect greatness. There's a lot of trial and error and things like that. And second of all, just like most things, there are going to be some exceptions. Being a psychic type or just in general having super effective damage on Koga while outspeeding the first three Venonats, it means that it's a pretty safe choice. And being a slow Pokemon, getting access to the speed badge boost is also very helpful. I bring this up just really because solo runs, solo challenges in general, they're so fluid and the paths that you take with different Pokemon are just unique. It still doesn't change the fact that Koga got a massive upgrade in levels in yellow version while rival number five is toned down a little bit with things like not having an Alakazam yet. I think the developers clearly wanted players to do Sylph around the halfway point in the game in a normal playthrough, but if you want to be a little snot-nosed punk in my chat, then that's your god-given right. I'll see you on the next stream, brother. Now we've sort of already kind of broken down Koga. We have a strong psychic move. We do outspeed the Venonats. That means Drowsy can just go in here, make this first three Pokemon kind of like a blur. We one shot and we also pick up Meditate at level 37. Batch boosting moves with a slow Pokemon. It's very strong, very necessary, but it's not important here. We can move on to the Venomoth. Essentially, you have two options here. You can just be like a complete little sniveling coward. You can go for Hypnosis or you can trust in the two shot range. It will heal back some of its health with Leech Life, but this one is not too bad. And I can't state enough how important that extra speed from the badge boost is from this point on. And now we're gonna go to Sylph and we're gonna immediately put the badge boost into practice. And tweaking routes and kind of changing things up from the blind run, it essentially allows us to do the bare minimum from here on out. I do the usual things like getting the Carbos and the rare candy from the 10th floor. And it's time for rival number five, but first let me just say something. Essentially every battle that's even got a, like a modicum of toughness to it 
it's going to rely on the same strategy. You've seen this before. It's going to be like we have to put stuff to sleep and we have to set up. Therefore, there's going to be some extra layers of luck and RNG put into these fights. And I'll go over it pretty good in this next fight coming up. But going forward on the extra fights, I'm not going to sit here and like meticulously detail every time I miss a hypnosis or something like that. It's not that interesting, but just know that Drowsy does rely on it a lot. And with that said, let's fade to black. Let's talk about Fievel. Sandslash is first, and this is a pretty annoying matchup. There's pretty much a 50-50 chance it can do something that's detrimental. So on turn one, I miss the Hypnosis. It goes for a Sand Attack, but it misses as well. So it's a no harm, no foul reset type situation. And from here, we're gonna have another reset. It's because I use Hypnosis, it connects, but it pretty much immediately wakes up. And when you combine just like missing Hypnosis or the computer just constantly waking up immediately, it's really annoying. And I can only just kind of say that in this moment, I was kind of like, well, screw it. It, we'll just we'll set up anyway and we'll just get through it but it uses slash a couple of times and it can just two shot me since it's a guaranteed crit not a great start to this fight it just is what it is with hypnosis you either take it or you leave it it's just how battles go sometimes on the second attempt it's not too bad now the ultimate goal the safest strategy would be five meditate setups now here i get the sleep everything goes pretty good i set up plus three plus three is kind of doable plus four is a little bit better and then like i just said plus five is kind of like the really consistent way and i I was just going for kind of like speed here trying to make up some time and it works out pretty good at the first but let's see how it goes on the next pokemon since we don't have the special badge boost they really did nothing for this cloister here and psychic can't one shot i take a clamp it does like half my health if you guys don't know how strong clamp is it's just really strong the base damage means that if it hits five times it's stronger than like a hyper beam so we take half our health and damage here we're moving on to the magneton and here you could be worried about something like a status condition or something like that Plus three is not enough to one shot it, which is unfortunate. I do take just a sonic boom, but when you're only at 60 health, taking a third of your health and damage isn't great. We can take it out in the next turn. And at this point, it could still kind of go either way. Now let's look at the Kadabra. Since I leveled up, I lost my speed badge boost, but it really doesn't matter because this is a pretty physically frail Pokemon. We've been over it time and time again, but it uses disable, it hits body slam, and that means that we only have psychic damage. Now I'm getting a little bit low, so my plan here is so that I have body slam up for the Flareon is to try to stall time. So what ends up happening is you see hypnosis at its absolute worst. I miss time and time and time again. I'm getting slowly chipped down and eventually I just, I, just, I go for the meditate setup and I snap out of the disable. I get body slam back. That means I can take out the Kadabra and I'm sitting at plus four. I'm really low. I'm at six, a little bitty six health right here, but the Flareon comes in. I outspeed it. I go for the body slam. It's a really good range, but I don't get it. It barely survives, and that means that it can take me out with pretty much anything, and it does. And that one's that was a pretty close reset. Going into that third attempt, it's really, it looks pretty good here. I get the sleep, I get some setup, but at the very end, after I use my first psychic on Sand Slash, it decides to go for Sand Attack, and it hits. Very unfortunate. Sometimes you roll the dice, and it just, the computer just doesn't want you to play the game correctly most of the time. I set up, I eventually take it out, and we'll see how it affects us going on. What ends up happening is I miss several times. I do progress to the fight. You can see that plus four makes me just miss ranges here and there, which is unfortunate because I'm not going to show damage numbers here, but like suffice it to say that like Magneton or Flareon at plus four, it's like a, you know, anywhere from a 30 to 60% chance to one shot. And we just did not get lucky. I miss a ton on the Kadabra. It chips me down. And at the end of the fight, we still have a shot. You can see that very horrible range on the Flareon. We don't hit it again. And I still have chances to win but the one single sand attack there's just enough sand right in my retina to where i just missed just enough to lose this battle again that's three resets not great but remember we've only had we had three resets on brock three resets here i'm not too worried about it now finally on the fourth attempt you can see that it starts off pretty rough it's the things you would think i'm missing a little bit it goes for slash i'm actually getting chipped down kind of low but ultimately i do hit just enough hypnosis and at this point i'm just saying i know plus five is probably where I need to be, but I'm going plus six because I'm tired of resetting. Despite all the data and the numbers that I got, I'm just going plus six because I'm tired of losing. And I do that and it ends up making the fight really good, really quick. 
I can't one shot the cloister. It has really high defense, but everything else cannot withstand that. And even though I level up and I underspeed the Kadabra, that's usually not an issue. It tries to go for disable. I'm surprised it didn't hit body slam again. And at the end of the day, I'm confused and the computer had some sort of mercy on me. It allows me to hit the body slam through it. I hit the Flareon, knock it out. And that's probably the worst battle in the game over. And rather than talk about the fight in depth, about my grievances with how annoying stuff can be, we're going to go straight to Sabrina. Now, on Abra, you already know, it's going to outspeed you. You're never going to outspeed Sabrina, so just go ahead and tackle it now. Will it hit Flash? And the answer is, after, especially after looking at that last battle, the answer is no, and which is pretty surprising. It misses Flash, but of course I miss Hypnosis. I get a little lucky here. It goes for the uh, X Defend, which is great. It means I got a second crack at it. I hit the Hypnosis. And here, unlike rival number five, I'm absolutely sure that plus five is the the exact range you need because this will let you both outspeed and do enough damage to one shot everything. I get a little unlucky on the Alakazam. I crit, but me being a psychic type means I resist most of its moves. It goes for a side wave for whatever damage. Side wave is awful, and that means we take it out in the next turn. And just like that, we have another badge. So if you watch the stream, you know at this point on pretty much all the last couple of badges, all the way up to the Elite Four, it was really tough, especially this part because you're so under leveled. Blaine still doesn't have good AI, but he has better Pokemon, better moves, and the choice here was to use all eight of the rare candies to get up to level 50 to give us the best shot that we can have going forward. And this leads us to a very, very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. We have purpose in mind. We're feeling good. We got a little pep in our step. And all of that ultimately leads to the lifelong question. If you just sit down and you think about it, you ask yourself, is TM28 actually Tombstoner, brother? Or not? It's really something that, you know, I'd like to get to the bottom of one day and that's gonna take us straight to Blaine and 75 maybe even 80 percent of this fight is spent just trying to set up and get the nine tails to calm down this doesn't go great and when you look at things in a vacuum you can say ah oh, hypnosis strats they're just full of luck they're not that great but when you think of something like drowsy that's pretty bulky has a decent hp stat and a really good special stat to give it that extra resistance to things like flamethrower we can just survive a bunch of hits and even though things don't go our way we take multiple flamethrowers things are very annoying it takes us a long time to get this thing to sleep and ultimately set up to plus six on our meditate it's it's not that bad it could just take some time drowsy has a lot being a psychic type in general you have a lot of room for error you can take a bunch of hits even if it takes the hypnosis four times to connect or whatever the case may be but we ultimately get the plus four that gives us not only the speed but the damage at the end of the fight i do decide to go for hypnosis i'm so set up and boosted at this point i think i could survive whatever it threw at us but i wanted to put it to sleep because i knew it would be a two shot because arcanine it's just a thick little puppy and trust me when I say you can watch the the stream if you want to have linked in the description the blind run but this fight was god-awful coming here at like level 42 Now going into the fifth gym, I am going to be taking on three optional battles and it's not because I need any sort of experience or anything like that. It's to manipulate my experience so that I don't have to use candies to do that. Setting up and getting extra speed with the badge boost is just so pivotal and as much as I really did try to cut out pretty much every battle that I could, I had to do these. It puts Giovanni and the next rival fight into some really good manageable ranges as well as let me go towards that end game and control of everything. Everything. So we're going to hop into the Giovanni fight. I'm not going to do an intro this week. And I'm also not going to go too in depth. We know it's Yellow Giovanni. The moveset is much improved, but it doesn't really mean too much to Drowsy. Now, starting off with the Doug Trio does make things a little bit more complicated, but after we see like a guard spec and we also hit our Hypnosis, that means we can set up. And the goal here for this fight is going to be plus five. That's going to allow us to outspeed. And since we just got Blaine's badge, it allows us to do even more damage with Psychic. It makes this thing a series of one shots. Now, without using candies I could not figure out a way to manipulate my experience to where I didn't level up after the Nidoking. King this means that Rhydon's coming in and in practice if you took any chip damage this could be bad because it's gonna take you two psychics to get past it but since I'm at full health here I had a pretty good fight here I didn't even worry about maybe thinking about hypnosis I just go for two psychics let it do what it wants it just misses a horn drill and we take the eighth badge this one wasn't as bad as like maybe rival number five or Blaine was but we got to show all the badges regardless now let's jump straight
straight into rival number six. And we're gonna kind of see like a night and day difference on this one compared to rival number five, mainly because I have that special badge boost from Blaine. The goal, we already know what the goal is. Hypnosis set up to the point that you need to set up to. That's what happens here. Sand Slash can still be a little bit scary, but I do get the first turn Hypnosis. I get set up and the number today is plus five. That's gonna allow me to one shot the Sand Slash with Psychic. And then I can do the same thing to execute with Body Slam. Cloister comes in, Psychic can one shot it as well. And we're just cruising. Magneton comes in, Thunder Wave or something like that can be annoying, but we have Body Slam or Psychic. We can take our pick. Doesn't matter, we take it out. But at the end, we level up to 54. That means we lose the badge boost. We no longer outspeed Kadabra and that's just fine because it really doesn't have anything that can threaten us. And remember that Meditate raises our attack. So we don't actually lose the attack raises. We just lose the, the speed badge boost and stuff like that. So we have more than enough attack to take this out. And then at the end of the fight, we actually outspeed the Flareon naturally all by design. And plus five gives us a very, very, very comfortable one shot range. And you can see what I was talking about when I said that it's a night and day difference compared to rival number five. And now my friends, we have the elite four left, but we're not done just yet. We need a very kind of honestly a strange little series of events for Drowsy coming up before we can prepare for the league. And this is one of the first times ever that I had to hold off on using a repel and victory road so that I can get one single wild encounter. I want to say I was like 65 experience short on leveling up after I do the optional fights I want to so this is kind of a first for me like I said earlier each Pokemon run has the potential to be like fluid and unique and this was just kind of one of those things I also pick up the rare candy here in Victory Road and I need to do one battle and the battle I chose was the black belt with three fighting tops for a very quick and easy one shot this is gonna let me hit pretty much exactly level 55 and that's the exact spot that I want to be in going into the elite four now we're a psychic top we don't really have much things to worry about but drowsy's a little bit slow it's very addicted to hypnosis and setting up so it could cause some problems it could stall us out but there's really only one way to find out and that's just to roll up our sleeves get a little bit dirty and just get down to it Dugong is up first, and if you ever need to set up on this fight, the most efficient way is just to chip Dugong with whatever move you got, rely on that 80% chance that it's going to use rest on turn two, and even though we have Hypnosis, I'll rather take the 80% chance here rather than the 60% chance Hypnosis provides, and we don't even need to fully set up here. Plus four is sufficient enough, and we can swiftly one or two shot everything, but one shot ranges are something that you're just not going to get on Lord of Last Pokemon. They're too tanky, so as a result, I get chipped down here and there, and by the time I'm at Lapras, I'm at about half health. Psychic is a clear two shot, but the follow up body slam by Lapras paralyzes me. And if she got a crit here, it's going to be over. But the added bulk with the badge boost means that I do hang on pretty comfortably. I deliver the kill shot and we're on to the next one. Up second is Bruno. We're a psychic top. You already know. I set up one meditate for speed purposes since Hitmonlee is going to outspeed me. And it's going to be the same amount of turns regardless. So you might as well do it. This one is never in doubt. But I would like to say the way that I set up my experience here, going back to the candies after Sabrina, up to the extra trainers, that little wild Pokemon on Victory Road, it means that we perfectly level up at the end of the fight on pretty much all of the Elite Four members outside of the champion. Now it felt really well put together, well thought out experience and level up control and like a badge boosting type run like this, it always feels really good. But that's the end of Bruno, let's take a look at Agatha. This one is pretty simple and it's helped even further due to two factors. The first is that Agatha doesn't have good AI and the second is that in yellow version Agatha doesn't have hypnosis on the first Gengar and that makes it feel personally for me a little bit better most of the time. The goal here is to set up three times for speed but I accidentally go one over but that's just fine. It does take me a little bit to wrangle the required sleep to set up but from that point it's kind of a foregone conclusion on how this one's going to go. If you guess that I'm going to go for several psychic one shots you would be right and this one wasn't too bad and like always it's kind of just front loaded and that's pretty much the majority of Agatha fights that we're going to see throughout this series. Now it's time for Lance and let's skip past the pleasantries and get to the relevant data. Plus five, that's what you need to know. That's the goal and hypnosis accuracy, it's not really in our favor for this fight. I end up going all the way down to 20 HP. Gyarados just doesn't want to stay to sleep, but I do give it the old college try anyway despite being low. Now at this point, I can guaranteed one shot the two Dragonairs and the Aerodactyl, so there's no issues. And that extra setup, the plus five, was so that I can outspeed the flying fossil. But the problems with this one come at the end. I'm just, I'm too low. I can't one shot the Dragonite. 
And in this moment, I do know this, so I go for hypnosis. And when all the chips are pushed into the middle of the table, hypnosis misses because of course it does. And this is our first reset in quite a while. The second attempt starts off really great with a turn one hyper beam critical hit, but our little taper gets the hypnosis to connect. I get some decent sleep and hypnosis luck and we make our way to that plus five and I take it out and we do have at least on a glass half full we at least have triple the amount of health as last time. We've already covered that it's a clean one shot for the next three Pokemon and I'm going for body slam now it doesn't really matter but the second Dragonair lives due to a crit and the computer starts to muster up all that cheating energy that it can it goes for ice beam but I say not today Satan. I survive. I avoid the freeze that the computer wanted and we can kind of cruise past it and the Aerodactyl. Now we can look at that Dragonite. I think I could still probably survive a hit at this range, but I'm not going to take the chance. Drowsy, it just can't avoid that hypnosis temptation, but I do hit it. And that means that even if it wakes up on turn two, the battle's already over. And that means there's just one challenge left. I did use my final three rare candies here and we know how the sand slash and the fights in general are gonna go for drowsy in the late game we've seen it before it's the s squared method sleep and setup i do play a little fast and loose here it wakes up a little early and i'm in kind of an autopilot mode with meditate and that means it does get off a slash for over half of my health and that's not too great but i do get to that plus six and we can see what we can do now a one shot on the alakazam it was never in question so we can just quickly move on and from there body slam it can't one shot executor but since it's not going to go for hypnosis due to good AI. I go for straight damage. It does use leech seed, but I'm not too worried about that in this specific situation. When we get to Magneton, Body Slam, and Psychic, they have roughly the same range for a one shot. It's really high. It's a pretty good range, but you're going to see me get unlucky two times here. On the first, it lives with a sliver. It gets a full restore, but after missing the range once again, I do get the paralysis proc. It gets fully paralyzed, and that just keeps us going on. A thunder wave would have been pretty annoying, but I still think we would have been fine regardless. On Koi it's about as simple as it can be. Psychic, it's a guaranteed one shot, but at the end of the fight, we level up, we lose the badge boost, but since we do outspeed Flareon and we spent the time setting up the attack boost, that's going to be a comfortable one tap, and that ends the run. Drowsy finishes the optimized run with a final time of 3 hours, 5 minutes, and 49 seconds, and that's not that bad. 7 resets with a sleep and badge boosting reliant Pokemon is also something I'm pretty content with. Now if we just type in and plug these little numbers into our fancy formula, we get a respectable 79.44 rating. Now if you want to know more about this formula, there is an unlisted video to explain what goes into it, but I'm going to say that this run, it was very, very similar to Clefairy. The scores reflect that. Look how close these things are. Today I'm going to have a slightly new setup for the tier list. Now let's roll out the top three and I wanted some emphasis on the top Pokemon so I drew some podiums, drew some trophies and here's the final result. Let me know what you think. Now after that I'm going to break up the cards into tiers. The numbers kind of speak for themselves but this is a little bit easier. A tier has 10 current Pokemon left in it. Then when we look over to the B tier we see 12 Pokemon. C tier has 9 Pokemon with Drowsy now leading the charge in that little tier. D tier has 8 Pokemon and F tier is going to likely be expanded since it includes ranges from 59 all the way down to zero but it's fine for now i don't have to worry about it and then you have this improbable slash impossible tier that only holds six pokemon it's never really going to change in future videos i'm just going to let the tier list go by but i did want to elaborate just a little bit and let you guys kind of in on what i've been moving around and thinking about overall drowsy was pretty good especially for a pre-evolved pokemon its stats and its starting moveset leaves a lot to be desired and it gets me excited to think about that eventual hypno run because it looks like it solves all of drowsy these problems right outside the box. At the time of recording this video, I'm in the thick of uh, some real life busyness. There's five total weeks in October, and at minimum, I hope to have another video this month, but I do, I'll do my best to get two more out. I'd also like to give a shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support means a ton, and if you made it this far in the video, you're a real one. I'd really do appreciate you. And that's about it for me. Uh, I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.